Hi everyone and welcome again to this 2020 Africa Cyber Defense Forum. My name is Bryce Abba. I am the uh, Community Development Manager at uh, Afrinic, the Regional Antenna Registry for Africa. And I'll be moderating this session where we are going to talk about uh, building cyber security, cyber resilience post COVID-19. And I'll be in the, I'll be joining the panel of, of three experts. We have Tianugu from uh, who is the uh, managing director of TechForce. Mark De Simone is the Wally executive vice president, sales and marketing operator for UK and Nordic Mia, Italy, India, and Asia. And Nuri, who is uh, with the security trade intelligence at Cisco System. So uh, before we start the uh, the, the, the the discussion. Let me uh, give the floor to uh, the panelists to introduce themselves in three minutes. Let's start by Nurin, lady first. Please, can you introduce yourself, what you do, and what, uh, the, the, what your organization is doing as well? Sure. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Awesome. I also had a slide there with my introduction, but... Uh, my name is Noreen Jaroge. I work at Cisco System as a threat intel engineer. Um, cybersecurity threat intelligence is my passion. Um, in addition, I like um, mentoring others because it's good to pass knowledge into the next um, industry. Um, on top of that, I have an engineering degree in um, information technology and also cybersecurity from um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, I'm also the president of Women in Cybersecurity here in North Carolina and also the global um, founder of a mentoring program because it's good to educate and empower others. Other th factors about me are like um, keynote speaking, sharing knowledge, and motivating others. I'll keep it short so that I can give presence to the rest. All right. Thank you, Noreen. Can I now ask uh, Mr. Mark Simon to, uh, in one or two minutes, introduce himself? Yeah, hi, uh, guys and the ladies. Thanks for jo having me join you here. Um, I've had a long experience in Africa. I used to run uh, Cisco in all of Middle East and Africa. And so uh, I've uh, seen the greatness that technology can bring to change and to acceleration of tra and transformation. Uh, so I salute our Cisco colleague. Uh, I run uh, um, the cybersecurity company Wallix for International. And uh, I'll be speaking to you how you can. Uh, uh, really prepare for the things that are, you know, we're not prepared for. And the world in which we're going to live is going to be very, very different. And I'll make some points about that. Thank you, Mark. It's now over to you, Jay. Can you please tell us about you in like one or two minutes? Right. I'm Jay, Jay Inigu. I'm the founder of Tech Force. I, I've been um, at Tech Force for three years. Um, so we started out as an IT support company and then switched our model to cybersecurity company. Our vision is simple, um, you know, protect as many businesses as possible in UK. Uh, apart from running a cybersecurity services company based in uh, UK Aberdeen, I, um, I also work with communities, um, schools, colleges, uh, encouraging students to get into cybersecurity, encouraging new talent uh, to get into cybersecurity. And apart from that, you know, I, I, I like to run so I'm a, I'm a big runner. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this uh, talk today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So now we are going to give you some minutes to um, to give us a short a presentation because some of you have a presentation. So before the discussion properly starts, we are going to uh, give you a minute, some minutes to like 10 minutes each. To do, a, to do a presentation and after that we are going to start our discussion and uh, at the end of the discussion we are going to take some minutes uh, some questions from the from the audience so if uh Noreen, yes ladies first so if you are ready please take your 10 minutes try to yeah have 10 minutes to give us uh, presentation sure um are you able to control the slides from your end so that you can move to slide number uh, i think that you you can also do it so that you will be okay but if you want me to do it i can help but i think that you can uh, you see you can, can do, do it, it. right mm -hmm. cool Better this way right 
Yes, it is. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I'm honored to be here and glad to be presenting how to move from cyber threat intelligence into intelligence. Because you have to remember, threat intelligence without context, it's just noise, right? Um, so we have to move from intelligence to, I mean, threat intelligence into intelligence. And on this slide here, I'm presenting data and information are not intelligence. Because I have seen a lot of organizations who are just subscribing just to intelligence feeds, trying to get that data or intelligence from them, but forgetting that data and information are not intelligence at all, right? I broke it up here saying, showing you what data is, information is, and intelligence is. Highlighting key facts saying, stating here, analysis, intelligence is the analysis of data and information to uncover patterns and stories that form decision making. That has to be in a forefront when you're looking at any threat intel feed that you're trying to bring into your organization. Let me take a recap and just quick review on what is cyber threat intel. Here at Cisco System, we like to define it as a dynamic adaptive technology. It's always a technology that's constantly changing because the cyber attackers are always changing too, right? That leverages a large scale of threat history data. You have to have a history data of information to be able to learn the patterns, the, the tools, techniques, and practices of these cyber attacks to proactively block, remediate future re malicious attacks on the network. Not current, present attacks, but even in the future because we have to be proactive always. Caution, I like to put this caution just to let people know that CTI, also known as cyber threat intelligence, is not a solution but it's a crucial security architecture component. Due to the evolving threats we kind of see, solutions are only as effective as the intelligence powering them. That helps us to stay at the forefront of our minds when we're doing that. This is my favorite part when I'm dealing, talking about threat intelligence. We always have to make sure as organizations and also just um, even small, medium businesses, right? You need to move to a more integrated ecosystem to help with tools that catch threats faster. We have to act at the speed of lightning, just as the cyber attacks are constantly occurring at a speed of lightning. We have to catch them faster, then see them once on your network, right? And stop them everywhere. You don't wanna mitigate one system at a time. You wanna see it once, and then be able to stop all across your network. So over here, you can see, uh, you can find, you have to have this um, integrated ecosystem where you find and contain problems fast, protect your users wherever they are, simplify your network segmentation, control and get your network and stop at the edge. If you implement that kind of ecosystem in your organization, you'll be able to see the threats faster. And then once, and then be able to stop them everywhere because you don't want them to continue leaking across your network. And as I say, threat intelligence without context is just noise. So you have to move from threat intelligence to intelligence itself. What do we mean by that? We have to make it actionable. In order to do that, you have to have a threat in analysis techniques, meaning you have to have a well-designed cyber threat analysis. You have to train your people. Your people are the greatest asset. And those individuals have to be able to be trained to understand the tools, techniques of the attacker, be able to answer who, where, why, how the attacker got into the network. Also, remember, it's always embedded into um, a human being. So imp implement machine learning that can recognize the patterns and predict the threats in a massive data sets, all at the machine speed because the cyber attacks are occurring at a very fast speed. We don't have our analysis being inundated, trying to figure out the threats. That can be overwhelming, overburdensome. Use machine learning capabilities. In addition, automation and detection and blocking. That should be your key goal. A must have as a proactive action to permanently block the threats. See it once, act fast, and block it everywhere. And then you also have to have that threat history data. This is all that the intelligence feeds, um, commercial feeds you're getting. Because it's just a thread of data they've collected over time, curated it, and start selling it to organizations. But you, even as an organization, you can have your own threat intel data, historic data that you can use to feed into your own intelligence teams. Remember, your own network data 
is very important and it's the most critical information that can help you to position yourself against the cyber attacks because you'll be able to see why is the attacker really targeting me and we have to have a threat intel strategy in order to move from threat intelligence to intelligence have to have an intel strategy i like keeping it simple so that everyone can be able to understand how to maneuver and use the threat intel itself first strategy is to have to know the target type what specific organization group within your organization is the attacker after who answering who who is being targeted at that time the second one is technology target what technology did the organization is organization getting exploited? Is it your WordPress? Is it your servers? Is it your Adobe? You need to know that. That is the method of tech uh, they're using to deliver. How did the attack vector deliver the payload into your network? Now with COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of spear phishing. You need to know that. Number four, exploit used. What type of exploit or unknown vulnerability was used by the attacker? And then moving on onto the presence of archive, what level of presence um, accounts like privileged accounts, database, VPN, right? Did the attacker use in order to carry out the attack? And last but not least, the harm or effect cost. What was the impact? Data encrypted, PAI, you know, personal, uh, personal information com if compromise, password protection or service downtime. What kind of attack did you get? If you're able to use that threat intel strategy from the intelligence feeds that you're receiving, you'll be able to have a very good uh, robustic threat intelligence um, analyst team who are able to look at the threats, react faster, be able to block them, not only once, but across your network. And having said that, I think I've kept it to a minimum so that I can pass it on to the rest. And then we'll take questions as we move into the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Nguyen, for your and a very informative presentation. I will now pass the floor to uh, Mr. Mark De Simon. If you are ready, you can please take the floor. Yes, can you, there's a, a slide that I had prepared. Can you show it for me or do it? Let's see. There is a slide in the deck. Uh, yeah, it should be. There's one slide, that's all. Okay, that's okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much, and thank you, Noreen. Uh, it was an interesting presentation. I want to go back to one thing. It's the best way to stop an attack is uh, just to block the attack before it starts. Um, and the, the challenges uh, that exist all over the world are that there is a lot of complexity in cybersecurity. And what we need to do is to make cybersecurity easy. Um, I used to you know, be in many places in Africa, and there is a need to train, ensure that people understand how to do it, and to bring this in information to everybody. That's why we started Wallix Academies, to be able to, to train. Uh, the technology we use, um, particularly as you accessing information, is to ensure that you know everyone who's coming into your systems. And because they're coming in from, from outside, uh, what we have done is created a privilege access management solution with an access manager that basically stops uh, or, or checks anyone that is coming in from a remote location, records the session of what this person is doing, understands what system this person is getting in, and completely eliminates the passwords. So you do not have, the, 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 this privileged user or the user doesn't have any access to the real passwords of the applications. So the passwords are kept in a vault and the user only is given a proxy. So this is what we do for the privileged user. It's quite important because whether you're a bank or you are in a critical infrastructure or you're a small company, you have administrators that have the keys to your kingdom. And you want to make sure that that information of who is going in to look at your stuff, what have they done is, is crucial and is kept under real tight control. On the other hand, you have the regular user that are using workstations. They should have no privileges to look inside the uh, information system. That's why, why we have a product called Best Safe, which basically blocks completely the access to the internal uh, uh, disks or the internal drives so that the user can only use the privileges that the applications for which this workstation is used are allowed. So if I have five applications 
then all the privileges that I can use on my workstation are those five applications, which of course removes the need for administrators of endpoints. So by having this two-tier attack, uh, two-tier approach, one about managing the privileged users. Who are the privileged users? Well, it's your CIO, it's your head of IT, but it could also be your treasurer. It could be also your CEO, because if they have access, you know, we need to know what they're doing. We, what I mean is we, is the, the, the management of the company. And that's why every session is recorded. On the other hand, at the end point, you may, we must make sure that you have no privilege to do anything else except the applications. One last point I'll say, clear that in this uh, infrastructure, the, e the, the important thing is also to understand the identity of the person. That's why we have an identity system that is very light, as a software as a service, uh, it's called the, 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 the Wallix uh, uh, MFA, multi-factor authentication. And you can, in fact, uh, ensure that also you have identity system. Now, what's unique about this approach is that this is not complicated. Um, this costs very little. Uh, this can be used on uh, as a you know on premise on, on cloud. And the more important thing is once you block these users from doing damage, you have eliminated the large majority of the problems. In, also, at the end point, by an, uh, enabling the workstation not to have any access to the crypto. Uh, drives of, of uh, Microsoft or whatever you, you eliminate ransomware. So the best way to defend yourself against attacks is never let the attack happen in the first place. So this is what we're doing uh, all over Africa. We're playing with uh, uh, partners, system integrators, to ensure that this information is available. But more importantly, we are uh, giving courses and training and certifications on becoming a cyber secure engineer or a cyber security expert from Wallex. And I hope that this has given you a view of what we could do to help in this new world mm -hmm. where you have to access from remotely. You know, um, most banks, just to give an example, all of a sudden could not go to the office when the COVID-19, uh, you know, explosion occurred. So they had to work from home. Therefore, they had to access their really secret information from home. All of the employees work from home. Here we are, we're working from home. This is maybe not going to be forever the same way, but it's certainly going to be a big part of our life, including defending audiovisual systems like this from in attacks inside. So I've given you a little bit of what, uh, you know, what we do, and I lo look forward to the discussion after. Thank you, Mr. Mark. For this By the way, I'm Mark. Yeah. I'm not Mr. Mark. I'm Mark. <laughs> okay, all right, Mark. <laughs> Good. Now let's go to Jay if you want, if you are ready. So yeah, you have the flow. No worries. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Great presentations from Noreen and Mark. Not Mr. Mark, Mark. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Building cyber resilience post COVID-19. Um, in my opinion, it is no different from building cyber resilience pre COVID-19. But however, the only change is the environment we are building it for, right? So if you look at it over the last few months, uh, this, there, are, there have been significant changes to m almost every business, right? One of the significant change being now users are working from everywhere, working from home, working remotely, your devices are everywhere. You know, um, if you are on-prem, heavy on-prem infrastructure in the past, now businesses have moved to cloud. Cloud adoption has been at the highest rate over the last three months, right? whether that is you know, using Zoom, team, Teams, any other collaboration tools, right? So as security professionals, uh, our job has been, always has been to secure the business as per the business needs, as per the business changes, as per the business goals, right? So what's your business need now? And that's what that's what we need to look at. Um, so, and what's the challenge? The challenge is, as I said earlier, um, users and the devices spreading all over the place. That might change over the next six months to one year, but it uh, it might still um, be a mixture of users working from anywhere, 
and make sure uh, users working from your local area network, right? So how do we protect? Um, how do we build a, a solid cyber resilience, right? What I would say is going back to the basics and getting the basics right. Um, what we are seeing just now, many, many businesses is they're having challenge implementing or getting that fundamentals right in cybersecurity, whether, um, sorry, can you hear me okay, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So whether that is, you know, basics like patching, software updates, you know, businesses had some sort of system on-prem in the past, whether that is, you know, WSAS, SCCM, or some other um, patching application. But now, over just over two weeks, you had to spread all the users um, everywhere, right? Working from home. So how, how did you adopt? Most businesses were not able to adopt, especially with regards uh, to applying security updates and patches, right? So we need to get these basics right in the first place. Um, as you can see here, patching, identity and access management, whenever there is a chaos, whenever there is a massive incident, um, the bad actors evolve and they you know, come out from their caves and try all different tactics to steal our identities. And, and uh, there was a, a statistic saying the impact of ransomware, the good news is the impact of the ransomware over the last three months has been less. But the bad news is the number of attack, ransomware attacks have been high. Um, the impact has been less because there are a number of businesses you know, not working from a local area network, also business uh, owners or business leaders are not willing to pay the ransomware, right? And then you're looking at secure configuration, you know, um, now working from anywhere and using number of different cloud applications, number of different logins we have, how are we securing all, all this um, um, changes, right? Are we enabling multi-factor authentication? Are we, um, leaving our cloud configurations to defaults, right? Or do we have policies to onboard new users in the current environment? And do we have procedures to offboard an existing user? There are tons of people put on furlough or written. I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of furlough in the UK, um, but um, it is a process of temporary redundancy, right? So, and people were made redundant from the jobs as well, but how are you retaining your devices, your company information, your company data? And also you have another challenge uh, where there were companies, businesses desktop heavy, or there were businesses that couldn't source enough laptops and they asked their employees to use their own devices or some employees brought their own devices into the environment. So how do you protect those devices? You can't install your, your agents on, the, on these devices and some of them not even supported. So now you're looking at um, implementing compensating controls around your VPN or your um, you know, a perimeter and other applications, right? So how are we doing this? Um, how are we putting our security controls in place in, in, the, in the current um, environment? Right. And the next thing, awareness and training. This has been one of the most important areas over the last few months. Um, as um, Mark and, and Noreen also pointed out that the phishing attacks have been increased by six or 700 percent in the last three months. And how are we making our users aware of these attacks? How, how are we making them spot these emails, spot the links, spot the attachments, you know, um, and how are we training in the current environment, right? And it is um, imperative that the awareness and training has to be a top-down approach. Um, it's not just the user awareness training, also your, your board needs to be aware of this importance of cybersecurity in the current environment and issue the right amount of budgets uh, to the IT and security departments Right, and the last thing here is monitoring. Right, are you getting the enough visibility? Right, and they get, then again, you have the challenge of BYOD, you bring your own device, and you know not having visibility into uh, employees' personal devices. Right, um, and if there is an attacker already in your network, in your systems, are they moving? Uh, how how are they moving in your in your network, and are you getting that visibility in place? 
right? And what's your incident response process in the current environment, right? We need to look at that and we need to have strong incident response policies and we need to have strong monitoring in place, right? And if you look at all these five pillars of cybersecurity here, and there is one thing common, a common thread that could be connecting all of this is cloud delivered security. So if you had a you know cloud um, cloud based patching solution in the past, you are almost not affected at all. As long as your users, your employees have a device that, is, that has an internet connection, you can push updates, right? And then same with access management and secure configuration and, and the rest, uh, you know, cloud based. Um, cloud-based CBT or other awareness stuff, right? And in terms of monitoring, you know, if you're a Microsoft house, there are great tools like Microsoft now have their own uh, SIEM solution called Azure, Microsoft Azure Sentinel. It, you can uh, enable by, you know, with just a click of a button, right? Mm -hmm. And you will be getting all the um, visibility as long as you're, you're, you're Microsoft technology house, right? So that's the cloud delivered security and I wanted to emphasize a bit more on the biggest issue we had so far over the last three months, and it won't go away any uh, anytime soon, is the phishing. The trust is the biggest vulnerability we have, as, as Nick Espinosa said, right? The trust in the sense we tend to trust, we and our employees, our users, our customers tend to trust whatever we get in the emails, right? And that is whether that is the email links, email attachments, you know, um, a, 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 a social engineering request, a payment transfer request, or whatever it is, we tend to trust. So how do we um, mitigate the risk? How do we um, cover this loophole, cover this uh, vulnerability here? Um, you know, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so. Phishing has been uh, one of the biggest threat we, we have seen lately, and and um, you know it, it is it is absolutely important for to train our users to make them aware of this uh, and make a behavioral change by providing consistent and repeated training throughout the company, right? Um, so, and that's me finally finishing off my talk here again. As I said, back to basics, get the patching right, get the access management right, you know, privileged access management, um, enable, uh, exercise least privileged principle as, as Mark earlier said, identities and uh, secure configuration, awareness training and monitoring. And all this powered by cloud delivered security. And this way we can build a solid um, and cyber resilience post COVID-19. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you, Jay, and everyone for this very, very interesting presentation, very informative presentation. And as you just said, Jay, let's stay to basics. And uh, I would like uh, you to, uh, Nuren, sorry, to uh, elaborate more about the uh, the threats, uh, threats intelligence. You know, threats it's, uh, itself cannot be, um, uh, uh, cannot harm our information asset because a risk is a combination of threats assets and vulnerabilities. So can you tell us uh, how you uh, uh, deal with vulnerabilities in your system? Was that, was that uh, to me or to Jay? To, no, to you. Let's start, yes, Noreen, yes. Oh, OK. Um, first, you have to understand what you have from your network, right? What, are you, what, what logs are you getting from your network, right? Then you'll be able to understand why is that attacker targeting that device? For example, if you're all constantly getting attacks for um, server web application attacks, is that server not uh, patched, right? Why is that attacker, attacker targeting that specific server as opposed to many other servers that you have on your network? So you have to know, know your own network, right? Protect your crown jewels. Make sure it's fully patched. It has the latest firmware. Right. And and make sure it's not if it's not supposed to be public facing, you know, those ports. Right. Make sure they are blocked. And just like Jai said, 
make sure whoever has access is just limited access to do their job because it's this little basic information like access and identity management that pose this greatest risk. And I think um, if that get addressed, it can minimize the risk of getting more attacks on your network. Okay, thank can you I make a comment? Yes, yes, please, go ahead, yeah. Uh, you talk about the network and it obviously for Cisco, the network is everything. And uh, the, 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 but there's it's something called applications and passwords. So right. we need to ensure that the entire infrastructure and application infrastructure is is not compromised. So um, you, you, we need to block before the event occur, not after the event. So the combination of blocking uh, and, and, and the blockages can come from attack from outside or from attack from inside. Yet the traditional perimeter security works very nicely. You know, it does stops, you know, the typical low level threats. The highest level threats have to do with human beings have to do with you know the endpoints being uh, compromised because they you know you have the ability actually have privileges on a workstation you go into the microsoft crypto api and you start having ransomware mm -hmm. so you just need to eliminate you just have to have zero trust not that you don't trust the individual but you cannot put yourself at risk at that level and you only give the keys to the kingdom to very limited people and you track them and you record everything they do and you have uh, four eyes or eight eyes on them so that you can see what happened and and you know the examples are i have a maintenance that's i have a maintenance person from sap has to go inside to do a patch or well, you have to let them in or her in you've got to give them you know a keys and you know we, we think well we give them a vpn well a vpn is not enough the VPN stops very dumb, uh, let's say, issues, but not the very sophisticated issues. So again, it's all about human beings. And the last thing I would say, just to come back to the cloud, is the cloud is a double-edged sword. Cloud is everywhere, and of course, you have competing clouds. You know, you got Azure, you got AWS, you've got you know different yeah, African yeah. clouds. But the world is not on cloud. The world is a mixture. It's a hybrid between clouds and on premises. Therefore, whatever solution you have, it needs to be deployable easily everywhere. So if you then marry, let's say Microsoft Azure, for example, not to mention one, then you're then, then you're stuck with whatever decisions they make about policies and whatever you. And what you need to be is independent. And I like to say one last thing. In this new world, digital sovereignty digital sovereignty is key which means that you know i live in the uk i'm italian that the country and any african country you need to have your digital independence you cannot have a threat that some foreign government with uh, for example the cloud act right which you're maybe familiar with goes into your system because some laws in the united states allows them to do it that's unacceptable. So when you look at cybersecurity at the highest level of governments, you need to ensure that nobody can get the keys to your kingdom and to your secrets. Otherwise, it's not worth it. Exactly, exactly. So you mentioned, Mark and Surin, that the, the, one of the major traits is human action, right? So what is the importance of training, of capacity building in this, in this, in this situation? So Jay, can you please elaborate because you also talk about uh, capacity building in your in your in your presentation so what is the importance of capacity building when the situation where we know that human action is the more dangerous in the information system sorry what do you mean by capacity building training the staff skills because okay. yes yeah, skills yeah so you know as they say humans uh, are the weakest link in our security right yeah. um exactly. Regardless of what controls we have in place, we can put a number of controls to uh, to stop the phishing emails at the perimeter network, or even um, you know before they hit our email cloud servers, uh, email email servers itself, right? Um, but still, uh, the bad actors evolve, um, and the we still receive these phishing emails. So what happens when they hit the mailboxes? That's where we need to build a strong human firewall. 
a strong um, security culture where our users, our employees can question uh, every single link or every single attachment they get from unknown sources or sometimes known sources as well, um, right? So it is that level of culture, that level of awareness we need to create. And how do we create in the current environment, right? If you, if you had some sort of um, security awareness program uh, before pre-COVID, um, which is great, right? You, you may continue with that. But if you don't, how do you, um, uh, how do you make a change now? Right, like with any change, you pick your ambassadors. Um, you 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 take a top-down approach. You pick your ambassadors. You train them first. Who would talk to other employees? Who would um, evangelize the change? Who would evangelize the program you have um, you have developed? Right, and then slowly you you um, maybe start from um, you know taking slow steps. Right, okay, training how to securely use a VPN service or how to securely work from home. In few few weeks or few months time, you will see people working from everywhere, like cafes and public places, right? How do you um, securely work from a cafe? Or if you are talking on the phone, sharing a confidential information, working from a public place, what do you do, right? So these kind of things, and then you, you take it from there. And um, yeah, so that's how, if okay. you, sorry, just, just one more thing. Um, if you look at the stats, right, 95% of the successful cyber attacks starts from an email so right yeah okay i yeah. okay. would right. like to add to what jay said um, yeah. building that cyber security culture awareness is very important um, i know it's commonly says that human beings are the weakest link but i like to look at them as the strongest link in your organization because cyber security is like a team sport we have to work as a team you can have the greatest defense mechanisms tools in your network but if your own users are not trained educated bringing that security awareness it defeats the purpose so you have to build that internal support of more, um, training your users because it only takes one to click on a phishing link and it spreads there across the whole network yeah i completely agree oh, Mark, yes i see that you want to add something go ahead no, I just want to say, to me, there are three buckets of training. One is the training for the experts, for the specialists. We need to make the IT specialist automatically cybersecurity specialist. They're not just an a, a elite cybersecurity team. Everybody has to have some basic training of cybersecurity. And that's for the people that are working right in the machines. The second bit is for people that are the decision makers, the, the users from the outside, they need to have cybersecurity. If you are a buyer of cybersecurity, if you are an investor in infrastructure, you need to know. You may not be the, be the the top expert, but you need to know enough. And then the third is for everybody else, which means us human beings, we need to be aware. Now, I want to just, Noreen said something interesting about the intelligence. I mean, we human beings have an uncanny capacity to learn to make decision no machine will ever you know be able to exactly you know mimic how our brains so therefore once you give human beings the tools to understand what's going on they'll be the best defense for the threats but you got to give them the tools hey, one, right. one, uh, one final comment i want to make is um, yes, communication, yes, yes. Co communication is the key here as well right yes. uh, make our users part of the team part of the solution. They are all our security team. Make them part of the solution, not part of the problem, right? Sometimes, right. you know, I see people, um, businesses running, well, we, 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 we run it ourselves as well, run phishing campaigns as a catching out exercise, but that's not the right way to do it, right? Um, they have to be done in a way that should define your uh, security awareness um, requirements, not a catching out exercise. So make people, part of the solution, not part of the problem. Thank you. All right. So now let's go, let's, let's go back to uh, the, 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 the cyber resilience. It's, it's uh, the cyber resilience is the ability for the organization to, to continue business even when the, 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 the system were harmed by any, any virus, any threat. So, and we, we, we spoke a lot about threat protection, threat protection. And, and we also have recoverability that is part of the uh, 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 cyber resilience. We also have adaptability 
and we also have that durability. Can we, can you guys just, you know, tell us more about why there, all those points are also important in why, when you are building your, your cyber resilience. So Mark, yes, I see everyone okay, uh, who's jumping. Yeah. Um, clearly the ability to, to be resilient in that sense, in terms of recoverability is obvious. I mean, I, I'm saying something probably that everybody knows, that if you have uh, some sort of an information system or data center, you've got to have a disaster recovery. There's no, no, there's just no question about it. And not only a disaster recovery, but also high availability. So you have high availability, which means in a data center, everything is always written in two different places, just in case. And then 200 kilometers away, you've got a data, you know, recovery. Now, in this sense, the cloud is a very good tool because if the worst comes to worst, you can actually send it to a cloud, or you can continuously send it to a cloud. And even though there are some areas in which the cloud will definitely be less secure, at least you can continue operation. I also want to understand, uh, stress one other point. We think about IT in terms of cybersecurity, but don't forget, we've got factories all over the places, okay? These factories have machines. they are PLCs, they are CNCs. You know, they can also be attacked. And, you know, they, they, they have the electricity grid. Once you attack the electricity grid of a, of a country or of a city, you can really create a huge amount of damage. So the resiliency has to also be in these very integrated high high end, end systems, right, which are the, the, the energy systems, the telecommunication networks, so that you can switch rapidly to an alternative source. In the case of power, you must have different power sources. In the case of telecom, you must have different fiber maybe, but you need to think of it as critical infrastructure that needs to be aware, available, not just IT. IT, to some extent, is easy. The other stuff is hard. Hmm. All right. I agree with that, Mark. Um, I just wanted to point out the, the fact that this, when it comes to disaster recovery, you also have to practice um, the dry runs for these events. Don't wait when the attack happens, and that's when you're trying exactly. to figure out who what, what's the most critical system to bring up and who are the people to contact at that time. As an organization, practice those dry, dry runs, right? As, do attack simulation, right? And that way you'll be able to identify uh, what are the weak and the gaps you have on your network or even applications or maybe your data center or what have you to make sure that you're prepared because it's always good to be prepared for that attack even it's not about if it's when. So when it occurs, you're able to recover very quickly. And even if not all systems, but the critical ones are already up and running while you clean up the rest of the mess. All right. So now let's come back to this particular situation, this trying time of COVID-19. So uh, most of us, as just, uh, Mark just mentioned, were obliged to work from home because you know we don't have a choice, any choice to do that. But most of the organization were not prepared, prepared for that. So what are what are the risks that were the, 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 the those organizations were was were exposed to and what was the case in your situation at Wallis, at Tech Force, at Cisco? What was the situation? Were you ready or you need to uh, yeah, I so, want so to, let me start. I'll, yeah. I'll just kick off. So so the, the, the access, okay? So you know normally you would say you have to have VPNs for people at home. Well it's very complicated to have VPNs. You you have a configurability. So what we did is instead we said, okay, use your PCs, doesn't matter what you use, because we have on the access side, the protection when you come in. So you know, it doesn't matter how you come in, I will ensure that the exercise is protected. And, and therefore, the, at least the critical engineers we really left outside. But my observation, I looked at banks in Europe, I looked at uh, people were not ready to bring the entire IT team outside. They were maybe ready about staff, you know, okay, well, we'll work from home, we'll have some sort of VPN, some sort of authentication, but the entire operation, imagine we are, we are doing R&D. We had to give access to our secrets from home. That was challenging, and I think this is the hardest, hardest part. Thank you. Oh, it was an easy answer for me. Um, we, we were already working from remotely before COVID-19, uh, a couple of our engineers work from home anyway. And um, before the lockdown began, we uh, we took a decision to send the rest of the staff as well to work from home. So, and we we, we do not have any on-prem infrastructure whatsoever apart from the laptops we used. That's it. So we use everything, um, everything cloud-based. 
um, and we have the you know uh, standards processes in place to protect our data. Um, so it was no 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 effect on us at all. Well, yeah. Okay, on, Lauren, on, what about on you? Our end, um, we, we started deploying people working from, we have a lot of people working from home generally because we all across the globe. But uh, for yeah. those who are always in their office, we started deploying maybe like 60% and then moved to 80%, then eventually doing 100%. Um, we were already prepared because we had started seeing the signs. Again, it's always good to look ahead because you never know what, what will happen. Right now we are looking at a long term, maybe even working from home because maybe this might be the new norm. Right? How do we continue maintaining such, such network, people working globally, remotely? Um, but in general, what I've seen in the market, um, when organizations were quickly to move work from home, not only just corporations, but look at even the education sector, where the schools have to stop physical learning and have to move virtual, right? Um, using our tools and technologies to, to help further the education, Challenges came to a point where security, um, just like Mark says, what do they even have the, the right VPN connectivity, right? What, what are they exposed to? Um, who else? It's also bringing the user awareness. Even if I'm working from home, I have to be aware of my surrounding. When I'm sharing data, who, who can see it? Not only those inside the room, maybe even those ones who are passing by by the window or who are listening. So we have to play this factor because we are sharing very critical information and your surrounding may not be um, applicable for that. And I've seen instances where maybe somebody data was leaked and they didn't know because now they've logged in just to a, a virtual system, but they were not prepared for that. So uh, as an organization, we were really prepared on this to go to the remote global workforce. Uh, we stepped up very fast and speedily to support others. And we continue advocating and providing user awareness, even as people work remotely. All right. Thank you. Oh, yeah. quick, quick comment. A um, couple of things that were proven in this pandemic were our internet can survive any amount of stress bandwidth, right? And, um, and the second thing is necessity is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. When we were at, uh, at this pandemic, many, many companies have transformed themselves um, in terms of digitally, right? And there are companies actually woke up and just realized, oh, we, we, we could have done this way for a, a long time ago. You know, we didn't have to send an, a, a, one of our business development guy all the way across the oceans on a business class flight for one single meeting that could have been done on a video call using either Zoom or Teams or whatever, right? There were a number of realizations. And I have been seeing in UK, especially um, in the news every other day, a business saying, we, we have enabled our employees now to work from anywhere for rest of their employment, not just this pandemic, because they just realized yeah. they can do it, right? So, all right. yeah. yeah. Okay, so now uh, I would like I would like to to us to talk about the the e tools that we are all using. You know, today as we do, we are all working from home and we are using many e tools to to work together. You know, you have to do meeting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what can you tell us about the security of those security aspects of those tools and 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 do you have a solution in your in your in your in your in your organization that you can propose? Like uh, Nurin, can you? Tell us about Cisco Umbrella. You know how how can it be useful in this situation? And yeah, yeah. So let's talk about e-tools and the security picture. One minute, very very quickly. We are almost close to the end, and we are going to, so that we have time to wrap up. Sure, I'll keep yeah. it short. Three tools. First is Cisco Webex. We use it for meetings. Our conversations are encrypted from beginning to the end. So secure, good to use for everybody. Recommend others to use it. Another one is, is endpoint protection, because you want to protect at the endpoint, just like Mark said, you want to protect the attack before they come into your network. So having your endpoint protection, Cisco Advanced Malware Protection does that for you. Cisco Umbrella, perfect for DNS lookup resolutions, finding those malicious attack indicator of compromises that are constantly out there in the threat landscape. So those are the three tools I can mention real quick, and I'll pass it on to Mark. 
right. Oh, for, for us, yeah. uh, I, like you just say, all the video uh, through tools like uh, Zoom and whatever you have some sort of vulnerability. I, I used to be part of the team that acquired WebEx went back, went back then, so I know the security feature, but not all platforms have the kind of security features, especially those, for example, for schools that are you know, spe speaking to thousands of people. So what we do is help them on the access management for the uh, for the infrastructure, not for the user, for the people that are running the system, but uh, clearly an, an area of focus. Right. Apart from Cisco and Volix here, um, there is another company that is quickly becoming a global, a biggest security company, that is Microsoft, right? Microsoft has been investing $5 billion uh, every year in their security and producing some great, great security tools in terms of an EDR solution and in terms of a SIEM solution. You know, EDR, you have uh, Microsoft uh, Defender ATP and you have Azure Sentinel. And, you know, fact is 80 to 85% of the businesses are using Microsoft technologies. And it just makes sense um, to utilize the tools available from them. And then um, the tools that are not available go to the specialists like Cisco and Valix here. All right. So, yeah, before, before we, 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 we close. So we all, we all agree that the, 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 the better defense is to, 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 to attack. So this is the reason why most of the uh, solution you are proposing are mostly at the edge of the network to, 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 to prevent attackers to be inside the network. But so can we say that we are well, well protected today against the, 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 the attacks like WannaCry? You know, in 2017, we had the WannaCry, WannaCry attack virus. Are we, are we, are we well prepared today? I would the say it's always a work in progress. Um, yeah. If you can never say you're a hundred percent, right? Because you're always refining. Because um, the, the attackers are constantly also evolving, so we always have to keep evolving and keep refining our technology. Remember, and tools and people, right? Continuous user awareness, uh, continuous tools deployment to help protection and processes and procedures as well. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I know the, con <laughs> Sorry, and, uh, the, the one area that I think we're not prepared, uh, I think in anything that has to do with IT or systems that are standardized in, in the world of IT, we are prepared. Let me say as prepared as we could be, and we will be surprised by more different form of attacks, but if nothing else, we've been tested. The areas that we are completely unprepared is all the stuff that is not really part of computer technology or IT, but uses IT, and you know this. You know this is like the access to your trains, the um, the the the, uh, the power the power grid, uh, the uh, the systems that used to be built very much in a proprietary manner. Every part of that world, proprietary world, which is was just like the IT before we standardized. That lack of standardization in the factory floors. In the operation, that is the weakness. And if I were wanting to damage a country, I would attack its power grid. I would attack its uh, uh, water sources. And that is something that is a should be high on the agenda of governments. Yes, Jay. So we are prepared, so we can all go home, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, we can never be prepared. You know, um, the bad actors always evolve. Um, you know, there are a number of businesses, right? Even even today, you see you see in the news every other day there is a business has been breached or you know ransomware attack, and then you still go to some businesses and they say, "Oh, this has been never happened with us, and it won't happen to us." You know, um, there's still a long way to go, um, and this is a continual process, right? Um, even if you look at uh, you, you mentioned WannaCry, right? And there was NHS was one of the um, worst impacted and then five weeks yeah. later we had not pet yet and as um, mark was saying earlier this was an issue of a best example for privileged access management right when when not pet yet happened um, the uh, malware got the credentials of the administrator uh, of the entire network so it got keys to the kingdom and within the next seven minutes it has encrypted 56,000 devices right and there are still we see the news every day there are still massive um, attacks like this happening so yeah. you tell me are we prepared 
Hey, Brice, I have a question for you. Yeah. Yes, tell me. We, we are, you know, you're part of the uh, communication. We are part of the communication we're having. I think that one of the biggest stress we have is really about falsifying communication, meaning fake news, the ability to influence people throwing things that we, you, you know are wrong. And, ha and that has been the, in the last eight years, a massive, massive issue uh, that uh, attached elections, uh, yeah. tax public opinion, uh, and this we're unprepared for this because this is a new world in terms of the people that have influence on our brains. We don't even think we don't even know who they are, and yet they're influencing us. Yeah, and have you seen the uh, news recently? There was a deep fake voice phishing of an engineering company CEO, and they managed to uh, siphon off two hundred thousand pounds or something. Um, faking his voice over the phone. Yeah. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those, those, yeah. Those are uh, the, the, the this uh, what's happening today, and we have to be very, very, very careful. And and you know, and some organization, some uh, some region like in Europe, they are also in France, for instance, they are set up some some law to fight against those fake news, and it's not very easy. It's it's, it's something very, very, very complicated to deal with. You know, in like two minutes. So now let's try to, to wrap up. So what is the thing that you would like the audience to take home after this session? So we have one, one minute each, and we can give the floor to Jerry because I know they are ready. I know they are ready to take to, to start the, the next session. So what's the key thing that you want the audience to take home from this session? Now let's start by with Jay. Right. Um, get the fundamentals right. Get the basics right. Get your patching, your, your uh, secure configuration. Make sure, make sure um, you make your users part of the solution. Uh, you know, make sure communication is clear and get the visibility on the network. And uh, one final thing, there is a question um, from Chai Bu. is he, saying, you know, um, job, job specs have a lot of information about the company that could be a threat, a risk to the business. You know, th my answer would be, job specs should be done by security professionals and not hr departments thank you all right thank you over to you mark very simple um train 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 and then when you're trained train again um and then the other part is do it in a simple way it yeah. doesn't have to be complicated it needs to be affordable so Think of affordable things that you can do, and uh, think things that uh, in the entire organization can adhere to. That can you know, support you in doing it, and start with small steps because anyway, it's a long journey. Thank you, Mark. Nuri, over awesome. to you. Yeah, just to echo what Mark and Jai said: people, process, and procedure. People are your greatest assets. Invest in them, train them, educate them. And for the experts in the industry, please share your knowledge with others because a better community shares information. And this is information that we use to be able to generate better threat intelligence information and also help other organizations and even small businesses to better be protected against um, the cyber attacks. Together we rise. So let's keep up working hard because it's a never ending job. But thank you for joining the session.